Good morning in the West, good afternoon in the East, good evening in Europe, not quite evening in London. Um, well, uh, welcome not quite to in our, Europe either. <laughs> right. <laughs> welcome to our mid-month public diplomacy forum. I'm Adam Powell, Director of Washington Programs for the USC Annenberg Center for Communication, Leadership and Policy, which sponsors today's program in association with the Public Diplomacy Council and PDAA, the Public Diplomacy Association of America. Jeffrey Cowan, director of our center, stated, started these mid-month programs with a mission of sharing information and exploring how we individually and collectively can help advance the practice, teaching, and study of public diplomacy. This program is being recorded and is on the record. First, a quick note about upcoming programs. Our next first Monday program on Monday, March 1st, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 noon in the East, will be devoted to public diplomacy and the new Congress. Our mid-month program next month will be on Friday, March the 12th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern time with Vivian Walker, head of the State Department Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, who will lead a discussion of the commission's report on public diplomacy and international broadcasting, which was just released. Today, we welcome a guest from across the pond and to introduce him from Los Angeles, our colleague, Nick Cull. Nick. Hello, thanks, Adam. Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Simon. I've known Simon Anholt for 20 years now and uh, admire his work very much. I think this is the first time I've actually had to formally introduce you to anything, Simon. So um, uh, Simon is a, uh, a policy analyst and advisor uh, who is best known for having uh, developed a number of really important indices uh, that give us uh, a profound insight into currents of public opinion, but he's also advised now, he must be more than 50 uh, nation states around the world uh, around what they can do to better engage with uh, foreign publics. Uh, Simon has a book out, um, The Good Country Equation, and um, I would recommend this. It's uh, not only is it uh, a really optimistic book uh, written at a time when sometimes things can que feel quite um, uh, daunting, uh, but it's also entertaining with a lot of stories about uh, what it's really like to be on the road uh, trying to develop or developing um, policy ideas for um, uh, leaders uh, uh, all, around the, all around the planet and uh, the problems that we share. So I'm excited to be introducing Simon and um, look forward to uh, hearing what he has to say and what you have to say to him today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor. I'm going to, uh, Nick uh, set me the challenge when we were first discussing this of trying to summarize my book uh, in 20 minutes. So that's exactly what I'm going to try to do. Um, uh, in order to do that in 20 minutes, I'll have to leave out the farcical and tragico-comical adventure stories with which uh, the book is stuffed. The reason I did it that way is because people don't like to read nonfiction any longer. And so if you want to sell books, you have to disguise them as novels. Um, but it turned out to be quite an interesting way of telling the story because it forced me to be chronological, which actually wasn't a bad idea. So I'm going to follow a chronological order here. My story starts in the late 1990s when I first became interested in the idea of country image. Um, the idea that I expressed in a, um, in a, a pseudo academic paper in a pseudo academic publication called the Journal of Brand Management back in about 1998, in which I made the fairly obvious point that uh, countries have images. And those images in a globalized world are rather important to their progress and their prosperity. I didn't say it quite as neatly as this at the time, but what I was basically saying was that countries that are lucky enough to have powerful and positive images find that everything is relatively cheap and everything is relatively easy. Um, attracting tourists, attracting investors, attracting productive diplomatic and cultural relations with other countries, it's a breeze if you have a good image. If on the other hand, you're a country with a weak or a negative image, everything is difficult and everything is expensive. So countries with good images trade at a premium, countries with weak images trade at a discount, 
and it's therefore really not a superficial matter, matter at all. And over the subsequent 20 years, as we all know very well, um, enormous numbers of studies have been published looking at the influence of national image on individual sectors, on the performance of those sectors. But at this time, when I wrote this paper, people uh, weren't uh, really talking about image and it was regarded as being a, a bit trivial and a bit superficial by me too, I have to admit. But over the years, I've begun to realize that it has some very significant impacts. Uh, the images of countries, for example, are one of the main drivers of global inequalities. Because if you think about it, uh, countries, um, poor countries, um, not only have to cope with weak infrastructure and weak institutions and weak economies, they also have to constantly battle against the headwinds of a negative reputation, constantly having to persuade people that they're not as bad as people think, constantly having to remind people that they're, that they're better or more civilized or more capable. And that drives countries apart. So there's an awful lot to it. Um, Nick uh, has done some really very interesting um, uh, theoretical work on the idea also uh, that national image uh, is a driver of security. Um, it's pretty obvious to, to most people that um, a country's population is more likely to support its government allying itself to another country if that other country has a good and positive image. If the other country, on the other hand, is unheard of or has a negative image, then leaders know they can get away with not supporting that country because nobody in their population cares about it. So arguably one of the reasons why um, leaders in Europe found it quite difficult to get popular support um, for, um, for criticizing uh, Vladimir Putin for his annexation of the Crimea was because many people within their populations didn't know much about Ukraine and didn't think much of it. And therefore the politicians knew they could get away um, without uh, providing any very strong uh, support um, for, for, for defending it. So 1998, I wrote this paper and to my surprise, it created a small ripple of interest uh, in, the, uh, in the general uh, media. Um, I wasn't really expecting this to be uh, a topic of interest to ordinary newspapers, but people seem to find it rather fascinating. And I suppose it was somehow in tune with the zeitgeist. It may have helped um, that I chose to use the word brand, which was a big mistake. At the time, I didn't really realize um, just how um, inflammatory and how widely misunderstood the word brand truly is. If you get uh, 20 people who understand something of marketing in a room and ask them to define the word brand, you'll get 20 shades of meaning. And they range, the, the, the opposites are really quite extreme. Some people, when they talk about brand, mean brand identity. They mean logos and, and identifying marks, corporate image. Other people talking about, are talking really about brand uh, image. In other words, what people hold in their minds about that product or that, uh, that company. So uh, it's a very slippery and very, um, a very difficult word to trust and very difficult to use properly. And it got people terribly excited because I suppose what I did was I put together the fine distinguished old word nation next to the modern slippery word brand. And this set up a kind of chemical reaction between the two that disturbed people and perhaps quite rightly and perhaps that was subconsciously my intention. But the fact is that I've spent much of the last 20 years fighting a rearguard action against the idea that you can do branding with an ING on the end of it on a country. And that was pretty swiftly how it was interpreted by, if you like, the marketplace. Um, there was a, a horrible and almost immediate collusion between the providers of marketing communication services, the PR agencies, the ad agencies, the branding agencies, and a lot of impatient or possibly ignorant governments who wanted a quick fix to a negative image. And they all started throwing money at each other and uh, wasting enormous sums of money on futile propaganda to try and persuade the rest of the world that their country was somehow better than people expected. So a lot of the research that I started doing um, was uh, devoted to trying to understand what actually did work, whether there really was anything that you could do to uh, improve the image of a country once it was set in people's minds, whether it was actually possible um, to uh, make it closer to the reality, to update it. Because no countries are satisfied with their images. I've never met one yet. Uh, even countries with images that are far better than the reality deserves are still dissatisfied. And they still say it's out of date or too negative or wrong or ignorant. 
Um, and so there's a huge marketplace for uh, governments that uh, would like to do something about their country images. But all of the analysis I did suggested that there was very little correlation between the amount of money that countries spend on trying to improve their images and uh, any consequent change in that image. And I began researching this more methodically in 2005 when I uh, released the first edition of a study which I unfortunately decided to call the Nation Brands Index. I hadn't yet fully realized what a dangerous word it was at that stage. And the Nation Brands Index has continued pretty much uninterruptedly ever since. I still publish it every year. It's, it, it, it now rejoices in the very clunky name of the Anhalt Ipsos uh, Nation Brands Index because I do it in partnership with Ipsos Mori, uh, the pollsters who administer um, the survey for me. Every year we interview uh, between 20 and 38,000 people um, in between 20 and 38 countries around the world. And we, uh, we, we send them a very, very detailed questionnaire asking, probing their perceptions of 50 different countries. Uh, I sometimes call it my index of ignorance because it's very clear from looking at the results that people don't know very much about most other countries. But their perceptions are, of course, very important because those perceptions are what drive their behaviors as potential consumers, potential tourists, potential talent, uh, potential mig migrants potential purchase of that country's products or services, employers of its population, almost anything you can think of will be affected by people's perceptions of countries in a globalized world, whether good or bad, whether true or false, whether up to date or out of date. Um, and so it matters. In um, 2012, um, uh, an academic in Canada wrote to me to let me know that um, the Nation Brands Index uh, was now the third largest social survey ever conducted. Um, I was convinced that he'd made a mistake and muddled it up with some other survey, um, but he showed me the numbers. And uh, uh, there's a little um, cautionary tale there. If you start doing a large opinion poll and you ask a lot of people a lot of questions about a lot of countries, before you know where you are, the thing has splurged uh, into uh, an unwieldy mass of data. Uh, and indeed, it had at that point become the third largest social survey ever conducted. It had more than a billion data points. So I thought to myself in, in uh, 2012, this would be a good moment uh, to take a bit of a break and spend some time analyzing that huge database, which I most of the time didn't have time to do and all of the time don't have the competence to do, but I got some help. And I wanted to ask that database a single simple question. Why do people admire country A more than country B? It's very important to know this because admiration translates into business of all sorts. Um, not just business, smooth relations, um, credibility, trust, anything you can think of. Um, as I say, I had discovered from looking at the survey over the previous uh, um, uh, five, six, seven years, that there was no correlation whatsoever between the amount of money that governments spent on propaganda uh, and the quality of their images. In fact, nothing that any country was able to do or say seemed to have any impact on the country's images at all. In fact, the country's images seemed to remain more or less unchanged from year to year, no matter what happened. Um, it was uh, some time before I realized that I had created not the world's largest social survey, but the world's most boring social survey, because there was nothing in it that seemed to change from year to year. And that in itself was quite an important discovery. Uh, the, the really interesting uh, discovery, I'm, I'm going to show you a slide, if I may. Um, I should warn you before I put up this slide that this is probably the worst slide you've seen all week. But bear with me, because uh, there's a reason why I think it's worth showing. Um, this uh, monstrosity um, basically shows the overall images of the 40 countries that have been included in the Nation Brands Index most regularly. Uh, since uh, 2008, when um, my previous research partner took over the running of it and the questionnaire became fully stabilized. Now, you don't need to know which country is which color, um, and uh, you don't really need to be able to see the tiny, tiny, tiny numbers at the bottom, but those are years that go from 2008 to 2020. But what you just need to do is to stand back and squint and look at those lines. Um, and what they tell you, first of all, is A, they don't move very much. There are a few countries there that um, experience a little bit of vacillation from time to time, but the norm is basically um, pretty steady, very little change. 
The second thing that you notice very interestingly is that the majority of countries' images move as a cohort. Now, why is that? They're certainly not working together anything like as much as they ought to. Um, so you begin to wonder if perhaps this fantastically important phenomenon of the images of countries hasn't actually got much more to do with the perceptions of the world's population than with anything those countries may do or fail to do from year to year. Actually, what we may be looking at here is just a measurement of the global mood towards the concept of other countries. Um, and other people who run uh, big surveys of this sort, looking at the attitudes of international respondents have reported similar findings, that there does seem to be a thing called the international mood, which changes and which messes with their charts, because what it does is, is it produces this kind of uh, 40 country waltz where they're all marching uh, in step. And the third thing you notice is that generally speaking, they all rise over time. And uh, I find that extremely um, uh, pleasing because it suggests that over time, the majority of the world's population by and large, this is a sample that represents over 70% of the world's population, like all other countries more than they did the year before. Uh, Adam and I were discussing this briefly just before we started talking and I suggested my hypothesis is because of advancing globalization, as each year goes by, we get more and more used to the idea of the fact that we share our planet with other countries. Episodes like the pandemic, well, there are no episodes like the pandemic. The pandemic has made us feel more conscious than ever before that we are all um, behaving and experiencing and suffering uh, in like manner all around the globe. And most social surveys do tend to show that familiarity breeds trust and liking. And so as we get more and more acquainted with the idea that there are lots of other countries sharing the planet with us, we like them more and more. Um, there are some years where it goes down between uh, 2019 and 2020, the very last uh, column there, you can see it. Um, you can also see there's a red line near the top that is a little bit less predictable than some of the others. Um, it flaps around a bit and it's going down at the moment. That's the United States of America which um, tends to buck trends uh, much more frequently than other countries do. Uh, again, this is a hypothesis. I've never had the opportunity to try and uh, to test it, but I suspect it's because the United States just features in more people's lives around the world uh, for, for more reasons than any other country. And therefore it's the only foreign country that most people ever really think about. Um, what the Nation Brands Index has suggested over the years is that most people only ever think about three countries. They think about their own country a little bit, not a lot, unless it's challenged for some reason. They think about a powerful country like the United States or possibly China if you live in, 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 the, in the Asia region, but not near, it's not nearly as volatile as the USA. And then there's a third country which you think about because it has some relevance to your own life. That's it, three countries. And last time I checked, there appeared to be 205. So 202 countries for the majority of the world's population to all intents and purposes just don't exist. And I think that probably explains everything we need to know about why this survey is so boring, uh, because people just don't really think about other countries and don't really know about other countries. So anyway, that's all in some ways a little bit disappointing, but the good news, as I say, is that attitudes towards the world improve all the time. So I began to do my analysis of this, of this database of over a billion data points, because I wanted to try and find the primary drivers of a positive image. Um, as I said, this was something of a holy grail. And what I discovered was that several of the drivers uh, are the kind that you would probably expect. Um, they're to do with the perception of hard or soft power. Has it got nice culture? Has it got uh, the strength to impose itself on the world? Um, is it beautiful? Because those of us who are sighted tend to judge uh, almost everything on the basis of its, its physical manifestation. But the, of the five drivers, the one that turned out to be by a very wide margin, by orders of magnitude, the most significant one was the one I was least expecting, which is the perception that the country is good. And by good, what people mean is, it's a country that contributes something to the world outside its own borders. In other words, it doesn't just do a good job of looking after its own citizens and its own territory, it actually benefits humanity and the planet beyond its own territory. Now, this is quite an interesting thing to discover, first of all, because it gives a hint as to why so much quote unquote nation branding is so spectacularly unsuccessful, because these countries are talking about things that other people don't care about. They are invariably banging on and on about their beautiful landscape, their beautiful culture, their beautiful history, their beautiful people. And somebody on, from another country is going to look at that and say, why would I care? I don't benefit from this beauty. 
I'm not a citizen of your country. It is of vanishing importance to me. On the other hand, if I perceive that that country uh, has a role in the world, which makes me feel glad that it exists, then that's a different matter altogether. So for example, uh, Norway, we discovered, despite being a relatively marginal country in classic geopolitical uh, terms, um, has a, a fantastic image, uh, way out of proportion to its real importance in the world. Why is that? Well, it's at least partly because people's association with Norway are all about positive effects on the international community. Lots of people out there I discover researching this have heard of a thing called the Oslo Peace Accords, and they're not quite sure what they are, but they think that Oslo is in Norway, and they think it's something to do with peace in the Middle East, and therefore they say, I like Norway. And in the last few minutes, as they drift off to sleep at night, they're not worrying about being awoken at 3 a.m. by armed Norwegian terrorists standing around their bed. They feel that they can trust Norway within the international community, and they're glad it exists. On the other hand, as a country like Russia, every time we read about Russia, we appear to be told uh, that it somehow disturbs the international order. And we don't quite know why, but we don't feel so good about Russia. And we do worry a bit about it as we drift off to sleep. And the consequence of that idiocy is that we're much more likely to buy a Norwegian product or service, much more likely to hire a Norwegian to work in our company. We're much more likely to pick a Norwegian university if we want to go and study abroad. We're much more likely to go on holiday to Norway to invest in its economy. And so it goes on. And much less likely to do all of those things uh, in the case of Russia. So within these childish stereotypes, these transparently uh, um, prejudiced, superficial brand images truly lie the fate of nations. And that's quite something to take on board. So let's talk very briefly about America just before I finish. I've left myself about one minute, which isn't really enough to tell the story of America and the Nation Brands Index, but um, I'd love to do so anyway. Before I do that, I'll just mention very, very quickly. No, do you know what? I'm gonna steal myself another two minutes, Judy, because you very kindly said that I was allowed to do so, so I'm going to. Um, first of all, what that analysis of the um, Nation Brands Index um, led me to do was to launch another indicator. Because I thought to myself, it's very interesting that people seem to judge uh, countries on the basis of the good that they do, but how do they evaluate that? Where do they get that information from? Countries are complicated things. They do good things one day and bad things another day. And anyway, what's good or bad, it's tremendously subjective. Where do they get these ideas from that are so consistent and so predictable? Um, and are those ideas coherent with reality? And could you actually measure how much good a country does outside its own borders in any objective way at all? Um, so what I decided I was going to do was to see if I could construct a composite index using data from the United Nations system and the other uh, big international organizations that measure these things to see whether I could measure how much good each country does outside its own borders. So the result of that was the Good Country Index, which I launched in uh, 2014 and which I've been running every year since. This, I repeat, is not a measure of perceptions, it's a measure of reality, even though it's only a tiny, tiny snapshot of a corner of reality, but a very interesting one, um, because it does provide a kind of balance sheet for each country on Earth, so that you can look at that and you can say, I'm right to feel glad that Norway exists, because on balance, it actually does do somewhat more good and somewhat less harm outside its own borders uh, than the majority of other countries relative to the size of its economy. And I believe that this is the fundamental question for the age that we live in. We shouldn't be constantly asking, um, how well is this country doing? We should be asking, how much is this country doing? Because on that issue depends our future. And that's for very obvious reasons. It's because all of the challenges we're facing, from the climate change and pandemic to small arms proliferation and abuses of human rights, are problems which are too big for any individual country to resolve. So we won't resolve any of them unless we change the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive, America first, Germany first, Bermuda first, they're all the same, to fundamentally collaborative. And then maybe we'll start making some headway. And so this is why uh, the importance of uh, the idea of a good country, how much is this country doing, where that, where that idea comes from? Because unless we can create or somehow foster a spirit of cooperation and collaboration within countries, we are truly doomed. The good news about this particular piece of analysis I've done is that it's no longer a matter for morals because nations, as we know, don't have morals. 
And I, like many of us, have spent a lot of time going around saying to governments, you know, you should really do more about uh, the migration problem, or you should really do more about human rights abuses, or you should really do more about uh, CO2 emissions. And we don't get very far um, because uh, politicians on the whole are no more moral than the countries they represent at this level. And they are much more interested in staying in power on the whole than in doing the right thing for the rest of the world. And anyway, as we all know, there are no votes in foreign affairs. So you won't get rewarded at the ballot box, even in Sweden, for saying that you're interested in something international. So it's quite good news that now I and many others can go to governments and say, actually, this is pure self-interest. If you start doing something which is visibly and dynamically effective in tackling one of the grand challenges that everybody is, acknowledges and which keep everybody awake at night, you will, other things being equal, improve your image as a state. And if you improve your image as a state, you will therefore, other things being equal, find that you get more foreign investment, more trade, more tourism, more talent, and all the rest of it. Which is why um, I was worried uh, during the uh, last um, US administration that um, the United States, uh, if it persisted in this very deliberate um, uh, position of, of, of unilateralism, of anti-multilateralism, that, that would fairly soon start to have an effect on its tourism rivals, on its um, attraction as, uh, as, a, as a, uh, a target for migration and all the rest of it, and that it would suffer economically as a result. I think we all, many of us felt that anyway, but it was quite interesting to have a model with numbers in it that would uh, uh, make, make the case. America's image, uh, just to finish off then, um, uh, is a little volatile. The last time it fell steeply from its conventional traditional place in the nation brands index, which is top, most admired country on earth, which was the point of America, and it succeeded in achieving that most years. It fell furthest from that during the second term of George W. Bush, um, when America was really rather unpopular at that time, largely because of the uh, invasion of Iraq. And it dropped to seventh place, which is ex an extraordinary degree of volatility for the nation brands index, which as I said before, is characterized by its boringness. Um, seven seven uh, places to move for a country within one year is, is seismic. But fascinatingly, um, in the year when um, President Obama uh, was elected president, it shot straight back up to first place in one go and stayed there for as long as Obama was in office. And that leads to an interesting question. Is 2021 going to be the same thing? Because uh, during the term of Donald Trump, um, America has fallen slightly further than it did in the world's estimation um, than it did under, under Bush too. Um, it fell uh, down to uh, 10th place, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I always forget my numbers. I can usually rely on Nick to remember them. I think it was 10th, wasn't it? Um, and uh, th so the question is, is it going to be like 20, uh, uh, 2008 again? Is it going to be merely the fact of Joe Biden stepping into the White House that almost automatically and almost without effort restores America's standing to the place it was before, because that's certainly what happened with Obama. I suspect it may not be quite that quick, but generally speaking, it's not going to be as difficult as many people say, because it's not as if the image of the United States has to be reconstructed from scratch. But more importantly, there's a very, very important concept within this that I've been looking at recently, and which is, um, strikes me as being a really productive area to look at. What I've discovered over the years advising countries on these matters is that the, the big difference is not whether people like you or not as a country, it's whether they want to like you or not. And you take a country like, for example, um, Saudi Arabia, which suffers from a somewhat negative image, particularly um, in the United States. And um, people in Saudi Arabia, particularly in the Saudi government say, it doesn't seem to matter what we do. We do good stuff. We give billions of dollars to, well, millions of dollars to charity and people still hate us and they still mistrust us. And partly my answer to, the, to that is, well, uh, that's because they know you're rich and therefore it's no big deal if you're giving away spare cash. But more importantly, I think the, the image of the country is not the message, it's the context in which the message is received. And so Saudi Arabia's image is the frame in which people receive the news that it's given a lot of money to uh, poor countries. And the response of many people to that is, ah, they're trying to curry our favor. 
In other words, the immediate assumption is that the motivations are somehow impure. And that's what a bad brand does for you. It twists everything you do in a downwards fashion. And that's why it's such a, such a wicked problem and such a hard thing to solve. And that's why messages can't do it, because it's the spirit in which the messages are received that's broken, that's at fault and needs changing. And how you change that is very, very difficult. Saudi Arabia's problem is that many, many people around the world don't want to like it. And therefore, almost whatever it does, no matter how good, no matter how praiseworthy, no matter how opposite in nature to what it's been doing before, people will interpret it according to whatever frame will enable them to continue, continue to ascribe um, impure motivations to its deeds. Because people want to like America and always have done, I suspect that its recovery will be a great deal faster. Sorry for going over time, but I'll, I'll leave it right there and we can maybe go to some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. And uh, we do have a couple of questions already. Uh, first, um, Mike Anderson. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can Absolutely. You. Thank you very much for very interesting work and uh, always enjoy uh, following your annual report. You mentioned a couple of countries in particular, uh, US, Norway, Saudi Arabia. But could I push you on a couple other very specific countries? One, it seems to me Singapore is a good example of a country that has gone from being kind of negative to very, very positive of late. And secondly, Pakistan strikes me as a country that is ex perceived as extremely negative and there's nothing they can do to change that image. Could you comment on uh, either of those countries or both of them? Oh, with pleasure, thank, thank you for the question, Michael. Um, so Singapore, um, the, the positive image of Singapore is ever so slightly more a phenomenon of elite perception than mass perception. Um, and it's very, very important always to distinguish between the two, forgive me if I state an obvious point, but um, elites, uh, diplomats, serious journalists, investors, uh, and so forth, behave entirely differently from people on the street. And their perceptions of countries are very often opposite. Um, and this is part of the challenge for governments trying to understand these issues because they only ever meet elites. And as a result of that, often end up with a very distorted idea of how good or how, uh, their, their, their own uh, national image is, because everybody's always very polite to them. And uh, the, it's the job of the elites to know um, how good a country is capable of being. It's a little bit like the difference between the judge and the jury. So um, uh, the, 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 the judge doesn't take past offenses into consideration and uh, studies the uh, accused and knows that it might do better in the future. So investors, diplomats, journalists, and all the rest of it can be very polite to countries that might be almost rogue states because they are aware of the possibility that that state might improve in the future. On the other hand, the jury is public opinion. If you've ever done anything bad in the past, you're definitely gonna do it again, and you're definitely guilty. So it's enormously difficult to make the public change its mind about places. The consequence of that uh, distinction is that in public opinion, when I, when I measure that, Singapore is not all that well known. It's not super famous as those of us who know about these things kind of expect it to be. And it's not even super admired. It's relatively admired, but it's not a, a huge brand. Amongst the elites, on the other hand, it's frequently held up as um, emblematic of certain qualities. Um, there's a mystery about the uh, image of Singapore, which I've never been able to solve and I've never had time to look into, but the, there's one exception to this pattern, and that is that Brazilians, ordinary Brazilians, detest Singapore. Um, they don't just know nothing about it. They don't just vaguely dislike it. They really hate it. And every time I run the Nation Brands Index, the Brazilian panel's perception of Singapore is right down there with the rogue nations. And I wish I knew why. I mean, you could see that they have slightly different uh, uh, world views. Um, you know, you don't get arrested for spitting out chewing gum in, in Rio, but, but still, it's a mystery. Uh, Pakistan, yes, I, um, I once uh, did a, a quite a detailed report on the image of Pakistan and it depressed the hell out of me. Um, because one of the interesting things about Pakistan is that it, uh, it, it has a dreadful, dreadful image almost everywhere, almost universally. Um, but it also gets enormous amounts of very positive publicity, uh, mainly from the BBC. 
and this is something to do with it being a, a Commonwealth member state. It's partly to do with the BBC just having a, a sort of inbuilt bias towards Pakistan. And in the, this report I wrote, I was able to reproduce pages and pages and pages and pages of brilliant positive news stories about Pakistan from the BBC, one of the world's most visited websites and one of the world's most keenly followed international newscasters. And it made no difference whatsoever to public perceptions of Pakistan, which were still and remained rock bottom. So if nothing else, that's the best proof you could possibly have of the futility of public relations when it comes to changing the image of a country. The BBC is the best public relations agency you could possibly imagine. It really does have influence over the media itself. It really can, over time, put out phenomenally powerful messages about a country. So even, if even the BBC can't make people like Pakistan, then what hope is there that uh, Hill and Knowlton or somebody like that will be able to? Um, almost zero chance of that happening. What's the remedy for Pakistan? Um, I think it's the, the standard message that I give to, to every country. It has to be gooder. Um, it needs to find ways of making people feel glad that it exists. Um, and I think that this is, um, people will often say in these contexts, yes, but it's a poor country. Yes, but it has so many challenges. You can't expect it to start uh, becoming um, a leading light in international poverty reduction. It's got too many problems of its own. But I'm really not saying that it's necessary to spend money in order to be gooder. One of the great things about the Good Country Index, the first edition, was that Kenya ranked in the top 30 overall, despite having a very small uh, economy. Because what the Good Country Index measures is not donations to charity. Well, that's 1 35th of the indicator. But mostly what it's measuring is how effectively you engage with the international community. And receiving money as aid is as much a part of engaging with the international community as donating aid. It's really got relatively little to do with that. Um, so poor countries not only can, but absolutely must think about how they engage with the international community. Because if we wait, until every country thinks that it's rich enough not to have to worry about uh, um, itself anymore and to start worrying about the state of the world, then we're truly doomed because experience shows that no country ever believes it's in a position of sufficient um, stability, uh, wealth, uh, justice, and all the rest of it that it can then start worrying about the rest of the world. So there has to be a new paradigm where even poor countries start believing that it's their responsibility to engage productively with the international community, no matter how poor they are, because as I say, lack of money is no excuse, nor is your colonial past, frankly. Thank you, Simon, and thank you for uh, offering us a new research agenda. As soon as we can travel again, we can all head to Brazil. Um, the next um, hand I see up uh, is JMK. JM yes. Hi, it's Michael Corp with PDAA. <laughs> Um, I really appreciated your remarks, uh, especially about uh, efforts to brand nations and so on. And uh, I thought it was really spot on. One thing I did want to just raise with you is if a country tries to highlight its good works mm -hmm. to other countries in an effort to influence opinion or otherwise just make sure that people are aware of all of the things that it does, what kind of a person should that country have as the head of its office that's going to try to spread the good news about what the country might be doing? And I'll just give you as my example, in the case of the United States, uh, our public diplomacy efforts have also often been led by people who have a background in advertising or in branding or trying to sell soap. And I just wonder if you might have any suggestions about who we ought to be looking for when we go to try to find somebody who can lead that office. Um, thank you for that lovely question, Michael. Um, my, my, uh, my answer to the question, what sort of person should one be looking for, is a person who has influence over policy. It's as simple as that. The vast majority of um, countries uh, that have nation branding units, um, and many do these days, um, they do exactly what USPD has done. They tend to bring in people from uh, the private sector who have experience in, in, uh, in the arts of persuasion. And uh, it's, it's easy enough to understand why one might 
think that that was the right thing to do. Um, but the person's background is nothing um, compared to the importance of ensuring that that unit has sufficient influence over policy. I, the, the countries that I've advised, I've nearly always reconfigured their, um, their unit in such a way that it's less of a, uh, a communications department, uh, less of a sort of um, spokesperson's unit, and more of a creative policy lab for government. Uh, the reason for this is because um, telling people about your good do deeds is a very second rate way of improving your image. Um, a, because people aren't listening. We're all very well trained to ignore propaganda messages from foreign states. We're, as I said earlier, also not terribly interested in them. So if we hear the government of the United States or the government of Israel or wherever it is uh, bragging about the good deeds they've done, depending a little bit on our cultural background, we're quite likely to, to ignore it. What is very much more effective is if the deeds themselves are so striking, so original, so magical, that the story gets told on its own. I often tell governments, if you find yourself having to hire a PR agency, it means you've already failed. Because a PR agency, in many cases, what is it? It's an instrument for forcing a boring story down the throats of an unwilling media. The media know what stories their readers want. And they know that you know this country has just raised its uh, overseas development budget by 0.5%. They know that's not a story. And so if you want them to run that story, you have to hire a PR agency to take them out to lunch and persuade them to do it. And this is not the right way of doing it. So um, one of the things that, possibly the only thing I learned when I was uh, in the private sector in the late 18th century was the importance of creativity in, uh, in, your, in your deeds. What Condoleezza Rice memorably called the diplomacy of deeds has to be above all, a creative undertaking. You have to do policies that astound people. Not every single time, that would be exhausting and impossible. But once in a while, you have to do something that not only does good, but also uh, captives, uh, captivates people in some way or another. If you do that, we're very lucky today. We live in the age of social media. The social media is waiting for these stories. It's wanting them and it will drag them out of you. Countries doing extraordinary things that benefit the rest of the world is the best possible recipe you could come up with for something going viral on social media. And so uh, another of the things that I often say to governments is the PR and the advertising and the branding agencies will tell you that the process of raising your profile is very easy and very expensive. I say exactly the opposite. It's very, very difficult indeed, possibly the most difficult thing you'll ever do, but it's free. Because if you're doing it right, you do it with policy. And therefore, if you have a unit, its primary function should be taking the policies of the government and giving them a bit of a twist, not at the communications end, but at the planning end, so that they are fundamentally unusual and they fundamentally connect with what with a wide range of different uh, players around the world in an unforgettable way. Then they do their own marketing. It doesn't cost you a cent and people will get the story very, very quickly. All of this sounds easy and it is incredibly difficult uh, for governments in particular to do because very often the culture is wrong. So I was uh, for a while the vice chair of the UK Foreign Office Public Diplomacy Board and I created a unit which, uh, which I called the PD Lab, Public Diplomacy Laboratory, and it was modeled on, on, the, on the Xerox uh, skunk works. I actually insisted on us having our meetings in the upstairs rooms of pubs in the East End of London and no civil servants were ever allowed to come into our meetings. And nobody was allowed to wear a suit or a tie because the tie restricts the oxygen supply to the brain and stops you thinking. And in every single possible way, we detached it from the culture of the Foreign Office um, so that we were able, and we kept a very, very, very high turnover of people, changing them on an almost monthly basis, uh, because that's what you need to do in order to be creative. Um, but finding a way of merging that kind of creativity with policy making is enormously difficult. I think I've only ever met three people in my life who are sane enough to be able to think of policy and insane enough to be creative at the same time. It's, it's, it's asking a huge amount. I over answered your question. I'm sorry, but it's a subject I'm, uh, I'm interested. No, no, especially about the, uh, the pubs in the East End. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a hand raised by Ambassador Greta Morris. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, Simon. This was a fascinating presentation. I particularly liked your, your answer to the last question. Um, but um, if, I, if I could, I, I would like to ask uh, two questions. Um, the, the first is I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the image of, of China, which of course has tried to, um, to provide a lot of aid um, to other countries, particularly um, uh, poor country, the countries in Africa, um, but, um, but uh, and, and also uh, soft diplomacy, sending pandas around the world, uh, having the, the Confucius Institutes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the first question. And then the second question is, um, and you, you just spoke about how policy is really the most important thing to improve the image of a country. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on some specific um, policies that the, the Biden administration should be focusing on that might help to, to bring up the, the US international image. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Well, um, China, China is, is indeed a fascinating case. Um, let me start with the pandas and the Confucius centers. Um, I've often said in the past that cultural relations is the only effective form of nation branding I've ever come across. It really does work and it's very cheap. Uh, it just takes a very long time. Um, you need a large number of highly dedicated, highly talented people working forever. What happens after forever um, is that you end up uh, with populations who are friends. And the miracle, the magic of that uh, is that forever after, almost, they can hate what you do, but they can't hate you. Um, somebody did some fascinating research uh, in Iraq at around about the time uh, we last invaded them, asking young Iraqis what they thought about the presence of, um, of uh, British and American soldiers on the streets. And the result apparently was something like um, uh, seven to one in favor of the British being there. And it then turned out that the sample corresponded almost exactly to the young men who'd used the British Council Library in Basra um, <laughs> and had done uh, Iraqi slash British co-productions of Shakespeare or whatever it was. This stuff works, um, but it requires enormous patience and commitment. And the trouble with democratically elected governments is that there's always the risk that things will fall in the cracks between administrations. The kind of longevity that we actually need for these things, you can only really get from a, from a hereditary monarchy, which is problematic for other reasons. I remember I was once giving a talk to the Swedish Institute and um, a young woman said to me, how long would it take to change the image of Sweden? I later discovered that she was a princess from the Swedish royal family. Um, and I said, uh, I said, well, first of all, I said, why would you want to change the image of Sweden? It's already better than the reality. Be careful what you wish for. And she said, yeah, 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 but seriously. And I said, I don't know, about 20 years. And she said, oh, that quick. And that was the first time in my entire career that anybody had, had said something like that. And I realized that for her, Sweden's the family business, always was, always would be. And if the change takes place in her lifetime or her granddaughter's lifetime, it makes no difference. And this genuinely disinterested um, um, uh, desiring for the good of the country is something that we desperately need in our elected politicians. But we need to find a way of, of, uh, of, of breeding that. And anyway, I interrupted myself. Um, so China. Um, the, um, uh, China has uh, broken all records in the Nation Brands Index uh, in the 2020 edition for the number of places it moved uh, downwards obviously as a result of the pandemic. Um, it's, it, its image uh, virtually collapsed. Um, Nick, can you remember how many places? Because I never can. Uh, uh, 10, it was, it was, it was at least 10 places. It's it? below India now. Yeah. Uh, so it's like 35 and it was maybe, maybe it's 10 or 11. Yeah, 10 or 11 places. And for the first time since I began uh, this measurement, it's fallen below India. It was always well above India before that. Now, this raises the interesting poss possibility um, that Donald Trump may have torpedoed brand China um, because I'm sure a lot of people around the world were thinking that way anyway. They caused the virus, therefore we no longer uh, like or trust them even if we did beforehand. 
but it's just a fact that America is one of the few countries in the, in the world with the power to brand other countries, um, a phenomenon which, uh, which I once called belligerent branding. Um, at the time, I was talking about Ronald Reagan and the, uh, the phrase rogue state, that once you slap that brand on another country, it's basically done for because, well, for a good long time, because America and particularly the American president have such vast influence over um, the, uh, the worldview of, of, of people around the world. And so I certainly don't think that Donald Trump helped at all um, in, uh, in China's image. So it's virtually collapsed. Is it going to recover as quickly as America? No, it can't possibly. Why did it collapse so far? Well, that's interesting. The only other time um, since I began running this study where I've seen a country fall by more than two or three places in a year was Denmark uh, in 2006 after the, um, the infamous cartoons were published in uh, Jullands Posten, lampooning the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the, um, this was only in the eyes of Muslims. This was not on average globally. So we ask a lot of demographic questions. It's possible to separate out from the study afterwards if you want to analyze it, people according to their age group, their level of education, their self-declared religion or what have you. If you separate them out according to self-declared religion and you ask Muslims, um, previously before the publication of the cartoons, they ranked Denmark about 15th in the world. Why? Because Denmark is exactly the kind of country a lot of those people wish they live in, lived in, uh, very prosperous, very just, uh, very tolerant, very modern, uh, very clean, um, high standard of living and all the rest of it. After the cartoons, Denmark in the eyes of the Muslim world had dropped to 50th, bottom of the index, below Iran, below Israel. Um, and that's, an, that's a stunning result because I've never seen anything like that before. And so I've, I asked myself, what has done this? Because nothing else has, no, nothing that's happened in the last 20 years has caused any country to rise or fall by more than a couple of places. And it seems to me that it's rather clear. It's because that country was perceived to have actually reached out and offended or insulted another group of people. And if that's what you do, then that's what will destroy your, your image. So that's the recipe. If you want to move a really, really long way in the nation brands index, you have to actually demonstrably reach outside your borders and harm or insult another group. I'm, I'm afraid I only have the recipe for moving downwards. I don't have the recipe for moving upwards. I don't know if there is one. What is the positive equivalent of the cartoons? I don't believe there is such a thing. Um, otherwise, um, I'd, be, uh, I'd have the answer to, uh, to, to every government's prayers right now. So hypothesis continues. This is what China is perceived to have done with the, um, with the, with the China virus. It has reached outside of its own country, its own borders, and it has harmed the rest of the world. And those are the only two cases where we've ever seen changes on that, on that scale. So, you know, homework for the next 10 years for all of us is to try and figure out what is the opposite of that? What could a country do? Um, China um, hasn't found it. Um, most of what uh, China does that's good or useful in the world, including um, uh, trade and uh, investment related activities, um, is subject to the framing that I was talking about before in the, in the context of uh, Saudi Arabia, that if people are not kindly disposed towards China, they will interpret um, its investments in Africa in a negative light, which is pretty easy to do. And even when it's a question of actually donating um, money, mask diplomacy or whatever we want to call it, again, it's very easy to question its motivations. They are trying to buy our favor. They're trying to um, hoodwink us and people are, are, are very quick to assume that. I have to say that the mask diplomacy uh, and all of that stuff, it was a pretty pathetic showing, wasn't it? I mean, all of those countries sending one container full of face masks in a, in a transparent attempt to make people love them. Um, and they seem to think that we're stupid, that we, don't, that we don't realize that A, that cost them virtually nothing, but B, they'd never done anything like that before and will never do anything like it again. Um, it's just, transparent uh, virtue signaling, and it really, really doesn't work. Um, I, I often say that in addition to the, 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 the policies that countries need to perform in order to make people admire them or like them or trust them, they have to have several qualities. As I said before, they need to be occasionally at least profoundly creative and magical and moving and startling. But 
they also have to be um, persisted with over a very long period. They have to answer to a strategy. The country needs to start off by asking itself, what is our gift to the world? Why do we exist? What are we for? Are we the world's policemen? Or are we um, the country that's going to fix climate change or whatever? If you've got that um, question answered and very few countries do, um, and you can say to yourself, you know, if the hand of God should slip on the celestial keyboard at 3 a.m. and accidentally hit delete and remove our country from the face of the earth, who would miss us and why? If you can answer that question, then you can have a, a grand strategy, not a brand strategy. It says, this is why we exist. This is why people should feel glad that we're around. And then you can start planning these uh, powerful uh, policy uh, demonstrations along with a whole lot of substance in a linear way so that over time people will get the story. One-offs never, never, never work. And even when they do work, they're forgotten in 15 seconds. Do you remember when the cabinet of the Moldavian government had a cabinet meeting uh, with, in scuba diving equipment at the bottom of the sea? This was, this is what you call a publicity stunt. <laughs> it was designed to draw attention to the fact that the Maldives was going to be underwater if we weren't careful about, um, about CO2 emissions. And it was a very good publicity stunt, but it didn't do anything at all to change people's perceptions of the Maldives because it was a one-off. You'd have to do something like that um, every, every month for 10 years before people started getting the message. And it also needs to be much more than just a, a, a fantastic demonstration of your vulnerability. It has to be reasons why people should feel glad that you exist. So uh, to summarize China, I, I could talk all day, but um, China sends out very mixed messages. A lot of uh, what um, Chairman Xi says about the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, is classic good country talk. Um, and you know, for several years, we were in the extraordinary position of the Chinese president being more one world um, and more uh, multilateralist than the American president and saying all the right things when the American president was saying all the wrong things. But on the other hand, um, there are other things that China, like any big country does, um, which are uh, less praiseworthy and less palatable. Um, so I don't feel I know as a regular citizen, what is China's grand strategy? I don't know where it's going. And therefore I can't piece together the things that it does into a cohesive whole. And therefore I don't know what story I tell myself about China. And that's probably the reason why I don't rate China higher than I do I'm pretending to be an ordinary citizen here um, in, the, in the Nation Brands Index. Um, it would need to attach itself to a cause that meant something to everybody and then do it. Here we have two questions, Cynthia Efford and then Matt Wallen. So uh, sorry, I think Greta her. had a subsequent oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Adam, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Then my second question, you've, you've partially answered it, what the Biden administration oh, yes. can do um, if you had some specific recommendations and you've already suggested some sort of yeah. tangentially. Um, for America, it really, the, the strategy uh, has to be ambitious. Um, the risk for America at this point in its history is to be insufficiently ambitious in, in my view. Um, and so I would reach towards um, the, the biggest answer to that question I could think of. What is the biggest thing that's wrong with the world? The biggest thing that's wrong with the world is the community of nations being driven still by a spirit of competition rather than a spirit of collaboration. Um, we need, as a, as a species, if we're going to survive and prosper, to, to change our fundamental culture of governance from, as I said before, fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. We've got out of the age of conflict. We don't go around uh, killing each other for, for, for land and treasure quite as much as we used to. We've been now for a long time in the age of competition, but it's still the same thing. It's still about ascendancy over each other. It's still about contest. Now, I don't have a problem with competition. I mean, competition is part of human nature. We wouldn't have growth without it, but experience shows that it can be wisely admixed with uh, cooperation and collaboration. Um, the auto industry was proving back in the 1970s that you can do a thing called coopetition. You can compete and collaborate together. America, more than any other nation over the last hundred years or so, has proved that you can do that. Um, this is what we're talking about. 
at the moment is competition first and collaboration sporadically and reluctantly when, when, when necessary and when unavoidable. And it's just not good enough. It's just not solving the, the fundamental challenges as quickly or as completely as, as we need. So America's job right now for the world is nothing less than figuring out how to change the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. It is a mere accident that that's exactly the opposite of what Donald Trump was often repeating about America first. It is genuinely a mere accident, but it just so happens that I think that was probably one of the most emblem emblematic of his comments because that was apparently, I believe, perhaps <laughs> truly um, his belief about the international system. I think Joe Biden probably truly believes exactly the opposite and that more than anything else is what the world needs today. I'm, I can't give details because that would take another half hour of, 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 um, of uh, burbling um, before I came up with an idea, but I, I think that would be the underlying strategy. You're on mute, Greta. Yes. I just said thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very much. That was very helpful. Cynthia Edward. Thank you. Um, I just was wondering the uh, one of the things that I would come away with what you said is that the United States is very, very different when it comes to branding, uh, except when we engage in total policy malpractice, uh, George W. Bush, Trump, Vietnam, we're going to be uh, very popular just by the nature of things. And so therefore our goal can be uh, not to uh, try to get everyone to like us, but instead to actually um, change the points of view of specific elites within a particular country in order to, to uh, gain adherence to a certain policy prescription we're trying to put in place. So I wonder if you could say something about whether this is, is true, that because we are so different, our goals in public diplomacy should indeed be different. Um, thank you, Cynthia. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I found myself saying to the Swedish government just a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, um, when I announced that they came top for the second time in the Good Country Index, is there's a tiny handful of nations on the earth of which America is one and Sweden is another, um, whose image is so positive and so robustly positive that for them, the question should not be, how can we improve our image even further? How can we curry yet more favor? Or indeed, even how can we preserve that? Because it will preserve itself. It's as difficult to damage your image in the long term as it is to, uh, to, to build it. Um, one is constantly hearing uh, statements from, from people who don't know about countries saying, oh, reputation arrives on, there's an old Arab saying, reputation arrives on foot and leaves on horseback. This may be true when you're selling beer, but it's not true of countries. It, it, America has been systematically trying to destroy its reputation for 300 years and it still hasn't succeeded. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a capital asset, it's not a liquid currency. Um, so Sweden and America and perhaps a tiny handful of others, the question for them is not how do we build it or even how do we maintain it, it's what do we do with it. Um, and this is often framed as being what do we do with our soft power and what do we do with our hard power. I'm, um, although I'm second to nobody in my respect for, for Professor Nye, I don't like the idea of soft power um, because I still think that it's, I think it's out of date. Um, and I still think it's inappropriate for the age that we're now living in because it's still all about power. It's still the language of achieving ascendancy over others. So hard power, you shoot people with an AK-47, soft power, you hit them over the head with a pillow. But either way, it's about achieving ascendancy over them. And as long as we're in that mindset, we will get nowhere because life on earth is a team sport. It's not a sprint to the finish. And what you do with um, the respect and admiration and trust that you enjoy as a nation is you bring the global community together and you teach them, um, the, if that's not too strong a word, um, that this is the way to advance your own interests and everybody else's. Um, so yes, I entirely agree with you. I feel slightly unsatisfactory. That, that answer was slightly unsatisfactory. You, you wanted me to go further than that, didn't you? And I'm not sure how or where. Uh, I think, I, I think you were heading that way. It's just that, okay, so our goal is not to become better liked. Mm. 
but I think that the goal could be to uh, get some of our policies accepted. And that involves going country by country, I would say, and very much burrowing down into certain groups that we want to teach or cooperate with. Yes, thank you for, for reminding me. I, I, I do also agree with that point. It's always very difficult to speak about America in this context because it's so big and therefore so busy and it will be doing so many things at the same time. And one has to try to tease out the, the important from the less important. That is undoubtedly important because that influence enables America to have profound influence over influences. And that's, and that's part, of, uh, part of the privilege of being, of being America. Um, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in um, something that I call entrepreneurial multilateralism. Um, it's the worst phrase I've ever come up with. It's almost impossible to pronounce and even harder to type. But basically the idea is you don't wait for the slow wheels of diplomacy to move. You don't wait for the UN system to laboriously put together a quorum or even a plenary of countries who need to fix something. I think the way forward in the future is a rather versatile, improvised, um, self-motivated kind of entrepreneurial multilateralism, where you just say, okay, here's a problem that we think as a nation, we might have, uh, we might be able to offer some, some, some progress here. So let's get together with five countries um, from five parts of the world, different levels of development, as different as we can possibly make them, nothing more boring than the G7 or the whatever, because they're all the same, and there's no fresh thinking in a group like that. Um, I'm, I'm uh, running an educational, well, I'm trying to launch an educational project at the moment that is designed uh, to ensure that the entire next generation of humanity has been inoculated with the educational vaccines that will enable them to run towards the global challenges rather than run away from them as, as we've done. And um, I'm, um, I'm launching, proposing to launch the project simultaneously in Greece, Guatemala, Gabon, and Greenland um, and Germany for no other reason than that they all start with the letter G. Uh, it may sound rather childish, but actually this is the kind of magic that works um, because people look at that and they say, oh, they all start with G and it's kind of cool. And they remember it for 15 seconds longer than they otherwise would have done, which is possibly just enough for them to decide to follow what it's doing. And uh, that kind, those kinds of teams, whether they're put together for reasons of just random magicalness or because um, the more mixed the team, the more different inputs it will bring, that I think is the way that we have to do multilateralism in the future in a million different ways, sometimes very short term, sometimes uh, temporary teams that will only stick together for the time that's required to make a certain amount of progress. Um, and uh, the United States, I think, has to uh, change its da dance partners on a very regular basis and be working with groups all over the place. It needs to be hyperactive over the next uh, 10 years um, in order to achieve some of the things that, that, uh, that need achieving. Um, and please, 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 Mr. Biden, let's not go back um, to the previous uh, multilateral um, habits um, and um, because it wasn't perfect. Uh, it wasn't perfect before. Things moved very, very slowly. And let's not forget how little progress we've made against climate change uh, long before the Trump administration started. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity to, um, to do things uh, really quite differently. Easy to say and hard to do, I know. And we have a question from uh, someone who's speaking of initials. So it's the same initials as Mike Wallace, Matt Wallen. Okay. Um, first off, uh, thank you, uh, Simon. This, is, this has been a, a, a refreshing uh, uh, experience. It's, it's, it's nice to, to, to hear your, your comments. Um, I want to, to add a little dose of uh, realism in sort of the, the international relations sense. Mm -hmm. And even though we, we talk about goodness, what it still comes down to on a national level when you are dealing with countries that might not rank so high on the list like Russia and China, so you're still dealing with this quest for influence, this quest for yeah. power for, for a variety of reasons, whether that is to, um, for, for lack of a better word, defeat the, uh, the, the less good countries um, and, and to exert your own vision of what is good mm -hmm. in the world. So, I mean, how does this relate to the concept of goodness and how we apply that to whether a country has influence or power as we've literally crafted entire national security strategies around the, 
the concept of great power competition versus, say, Russia or China. Sure. Um, well, thanks for that, Matthew. I mean, um, the, the, the immediate answer to that is that um, part of the uh, interesting, um, um, the, the interest in this sort of good country equation model is that it is designed to appeal to the traditional self-interest of uh, nation states, uh, be they good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so um, uh, last time I had dinner with Vladimir Putin, he said casually, um, I did mention to him that uh, he would probably find um, that if he started doing things that were perceived as beneficial to the international community, um, he would find that it was easier to get foreign investment, it was easier to get tourism, uh, it was inter easy to get all the rest of it. I don't think he believed me, um, but the numbers do suggest that that is the case. It may well be, be that he doesn't care. It may be that he feels that um, there's enough money in the Russian economy anyway, and they don't need to depend on outsiders. It may also be, and I did get this impression from, from the conversation I had with him, um, that he feels they already do do good around the world. It just isn't appreciated. Um, and um, the um, occasional acts of, uh, of uh, surprise diplomacy that um, Russia pulls out when there are uh, international system uh, situations that need unsticking were um, evidence that he, he brought to play here. We are, of course, never going to get all countries on side. And a part of America's concern is always going to have to be um, to keep an eye out for potential troublemakers um, and to have um, the hard power to be able to deal with them when these things happen. Um, you have to be partly realistic, of course. Um, but like all fundamental changes in the, um, the, the, the culture of governance or the culture of populations, uh, it's not total right away. Um, there are quite a significant number of countries who are already um, by, in, in various ways buying into this approach. I can see them doing it. Um, it obviously has a particular appeal for weaker countries who only have the soft power option anyway. Um, and they're quite a large number of them. And so I think that is generally speaking the way that change happens. Um, you get a few that will stick with the old system because it suits them and because they um, because they play a powerful game in the old system and they stick will stick with it for as long as they can and they will one hopes find themselves in a smaller or smaller minority and you have to keep a truncheon in your back pocket to to to, to keep them in order if they don't do that but you know the the um, I I see many of the um, politicians I deal with and many of the countries I deal with. Um, finding this approach to be very much to their liking, very anxious to see the, the proof, the evidence that it really re will work as good politicians. Of course, they do want to know that, but they, a surprising number of them, really the overwhelming majority, it turns out, actually really would quite like to do something for the planet and for humanity. They're just afraid that their population won't thank them for it. Um, it's really as simple as that. And that's the reason also why it's very, um, I spend quite a lot of my time trying to get these messages across to populations as well as to leaders, because it kind of has to be also demanded by the populations who tend to get the politicians they deserve. And so if one really wanted to make this whole good country thing catch on and work, you really would need to be uh, doing a sort of a mass movement at the same time as private diplomacy. And if those two things then came together, then I think things really could start to change. But it is surprising how um, these arguments can, from time to time, make people flip. Um, when I was advising uh, the um, government of South Korea quite a few years ago, I remember having a conversation with the with the then uh, president about the question of um, their um, overseas development contributions, which were which were very low considering the size of their economy, and um, I suggested that if they were to uh, increase them to the acceptable 0.7. Uh, percent recommended UN level, that might produce other benefits. They could talk about it and people might um, be uh, impressed. And blow me if they didn't just go right ahead and do it. Uh, at the same time, of course, bragging the fact uh, about the fact that they were now giving more money to overseas development than Japan or the United States uh, relative to the size of their economy, that's fine. Um, but it was interesting because after that happened, and I still don't know whether I was directly responsible or not, but I think it might have had something to do with it. 
and I was uh, back in the UK and I was talking to a friend at the Foreign Office who was on the on the on the uh, Korea desk. And he said, it's amazing. He said, we've been telling them to increase their foreign aid for, for, for decades and they always tell us to get lost. Um, and now they've suddenly done it. And I thought to myself, well, in some ways that's not surprising because if the UK comes along and says, we posh countries think that you other countries who want to be posh as well ought to behave like us if you're going to be posh, it, it's rather irritating. On the other hand, if somebody comes along and says, look, this is good for trade, maybe they'll give it a try. So I try to build in a bit of rail politique into, into the system. And for me, the best news really from, from all of this um, analysis, all of this research was the fact that there is, um, there is a measure of self-interest there, which appears to be enough to occasionally shift people's positions. I wonder if I can get one last question and I know you have a short answer to it, uh, which is you've written that working with less developed countries was often more stimulating than working with rich countries. Why is that? <laughs> it's just because um, rich countries have this awful habit of hiring people like me so that they, they can then say they listened to what I said and decided it was better to ignore it, um, <laughs> like covering their bases. Poor countries, on the other hand, really do need to change and that makes them much more agreeable and more likely to take your advice. Well, thank you very much, Simon. And uh, that's actually a quote from your book. Uh, Nick, uh, if you want to hold up the book again so everyone can see it, I, I know you have it right there on your desk. Uh, a good country equation. Buy and now. Have, <laughs> and you will make me a, richer by 10 cents each if you buy it. And has been described as a masterpiece by none other than the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for being with us, Simon Anholt. Uh, uh, and uh, for, uh, uh, I guess, not keeping you too late um, over there on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, so uh, we uh, look forward to uh, more of your writing and uh, more of your advice to, uh, to countries large and small. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you again Our soon. Yes. Our upcoming sessions, uh, Monday, March 1st at uh, 12 noon uh, Eastern Time, Public Diplomacy and the New Congress. And our next mid-month forum uh, on Friday, March 12th at 12 noon Eastern Time with uh, Vivian Walker, head of the State Department Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. And so until then, we're adjourned.